All right, so the Nissan Duke has been a pretty popular model uh, through the years that it's been around. They celebrated nearly a million sales not too long ago. And um, if you start looking through them on the road, it won't take too long to find one. And in this generation, they've made some minor tweaks that make the overall, I think, the overall design just that little bit more palatable for a lot more people and um, bringing a few other nice little tweaks along the way. But this one here is the Nissan Duke STL. It is the second highest model in the entire range. You've got the ST, the ST Plus, the STL, and then the TI. And this one, this is 36,490 drive away. And um, let's have a look around at what it's got. We'll start at the back right here. So the biggest thing on this one is that you have 19 inch alloy wheels and uh, you step up as well. It's, it's, it's kind of a big deal for some people who really care, but you actually get disc brakes on the back on this one. On the lower models, you only have drum brakes. Uh, it's kind of a weird um, sort of cost, cost saving measure, but it's, uh, it's nice to see it at least in the higher models. The difference is as well from that in, in, in the higher model, the TI, you do go from a, a remote control car radio antenna all the way up to a, a shark fin um, on there. But as we move through, there are things on the side are mostly the same for the Nissan Duke. But if we come around to the front, we'll see that a, a, quite a few different design tweaks have been made. So we now have an LED headlight setup. It now looks a little bit less like you've got three different sets of headlights compared to the old model, um, but you still have very much the distinctive Nissan Duke design um, of the, the headlights, the, the indicator area, and um, your little spotlights down here. But overall, very much still Nissan Duke. Uh, when you have a look at it, it's, it's unmistakable compared to any other model that's out there. Um, the only car that you'd probably be uh, forgiven of mixing it up with is the Toyota CHR, where they, from certain angles, share a fairly similar design uh, design philosophy. But up here, we do have our first front up front camera, and that forms part of that 360 degree uh, camera view that you have, which makes parking super easy and also navigating uh, a few tight bits here and there just that little bit easier. Um, you also have your radar sensor down here for your radar cruise control. So that's really handy as well, particularly in uh, peak hour traffic when you stop, start, crawling, all that kind of thing. That's where it comes in really handy. But let's move around, keep going around here. Up here, we've got our, our black mirrors, uh, integrated turn signals. And under here, we've got those side cameras that give you that side view. Um, that also, in on the, and when we have a look on the inside, you'll also see the, um, the handy, what I call like gutter cam, where if uh, you are doing a, a park against the, the curb, you can just make sure that you're not gonna damage your nice wheels. Back here. So they've gone for a really coupe style design by hiding those uh, rear door handles. So rather than joining it down here, nice high water line with the, with the, the back door handle right here. We'll keep going around and then we'll arrive at the back. And this is probably the area that looks the most similar to the Toyota CHR. A lot of things are very similar here. Um, nice and simple badging. They don't, I think it's kind of a nice little touch that they don't absolutely advertise what spec you're driving. Um, I think they're, they keep it nice and clean and nice and simple. We get your rear parking sensors, rear camera as well. So it's part of that 360 camera view as well. And um, yeah, and, and there's only a petrol petrol option. So it's a one liter, uh, three cylinder turbocharged engine. There's no hybrid options. And so with that, you're getting 84 kilowatts of power plus 180 new meters of torque. All right, so we're in the inside here and um, it's very much your typical Nissan interior. So you've got the, the Nissan steering wheel with the flat bottom, and um, you've got your, your seven inch infotainment screen right here, which we'll just turn on there for you. And so the infotainment system is actually quite good. Uh, there's nothing really to complain about there. It's got Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, um, um, as well as your typical sort of built-in nav. But, if you're anybody who this car is marketed for, you're probably not gonna be using the built-in um, navigation system very much at all. 
But this is where you've got your uh, quick access buttons here as well. So we'll hit the cameras and this is where you can see your 360 camera, your forward facing camera. And uh, if you hit that again, that's uh, what I called the, the gutter cam right there. But you can do that when you're uh, looking to, to, par to park or even if you are going at a slow pace and the sensors um, pick something up, they will also turn the camera on for you. Here you've got uh, all of your air conditioning vents. You can fire them anywhere, turn it off to just turn it to the right to turn it off or turn it to the left to turn it on. Uh, you've got your climate control, seat warmers, which do get quite toasty very quickly. Um, I would say that the air conditioning, kind of like the, the Triton that we drove not too long ago, it only goes down to 18 degrees. And even then, sometimes it's not as cold as you'd really hope it to be, uh, particularly on a, on a really hot Queensland day. Uh, so, but we don't know if that's really a hit and miss thing. It's been on both um, in different ways, both Nissan Jukes we've driven so far. So um, not a very good sort of history pattern right there. But moving through, so you've got the, the start button, a very racy start button down here. Very simple automatic gearbox. There is no manual uh, or sort of any sort of different gearbox options here. You've got your drive modes, and so that goes in between your standard and eco. Not really anything more exciting as such as like a sport mode or anything like that. So quick video after the fact. Um, there is actually a sport mode. It doesn't really do too much, um, but rather than hitting the drive mode button down, if you hit it up, it puts it into sport mode. But all it really kind of does from what I can tell is it just holds onto gears a little bit longer. It doesn't actually really improve um, responsiveness too much. It still lags a bit when you're taking off, um, but I did just want to clarify that uh, when we were playing around with the car a little bit more in getting some shots, we did discover it actually does sport mode. So there you go. Uh, electric park brake and your auto hold, though found that haven't really needed to find or use uh, auto hold much at all, uh, which is quite good. And then let's move on to the steering wheel. So you've got all of your multimedia controls, your center screen controls for on your dash, active cruise and speed limiter, fairly, fairly standard affair right there. And then on our screen in here, we can move through a whole heap of different. So you've got your nav directions on here, your general info, so your trip. Uh, fuel economy, so fuel economy in this is claimed to be about 5.8. At the moment, we're getting 6.6, .6, which I think is kind of not too bad. Um, certainly a lot closer to the claim figure than we've seen in the, in the past. Um, but look, in here, nothing much to complain about. Nice dark roof headlining. Um, I'm always a big fan of that. Nice big uh, sunshades as well. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's it there, but let's have a quick look at the back. All right, so this is where things get a little bit squeezy. So I'm set up with my seat in front. I'm six foot one and uh, I can just squeeze in back here. You don't get any additional air vents or anything like that. Uh, your windows, you do have a little bit of a, a catch here just because of the design of the doors, but headroom is actually a bit better than I expected compared to other vehicles. But um, but yeah, if, 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 you, if you're a tall person driving and you're going to be having passengers that are also tall, maybe this isn't the exact car for you. Um, but if you've got a couple of small kids, You'll, uh, you'll certainly have no problems here. You do have a little USB charging point down here as well, which is uh, handy for the odd thing that you might, might have to charge. But let's check out the boot. Best thing of all, you do have a, you don't need the key. This is a, a keyless sort of system. As long as you've got it on you in your pocket, you can lock and unlock the car without any problems. Um, no magic trickery or anything like that. It is just a standard affair where you walk up and open the boot. But in terms of boot space, it's actually quite healthy. Uh, nice and deep. Um, you do have a space saver spare underneath. Uh, so it's not a full spare, but it's, uh, it's better than nothing, I guess. 
But under here, so you can see we've got a couple of bags, cameras, not too, not too much. Um, you can put the seats down. It isn't a fully flat system, um, but certainly we've had eskies and all sorts of things in the back there with no, no problem. So what you, what you lose in, in rear passenger space, you pick up in the boot. Um, but let's go for a quick drive. So we're out on the road now and look, there's, there's not really too much to complain about. Like sure, okay, now the seven speed automatic and the lag that comes from the turbo, it, it almost feels like they, they just don't know how to talk to each other. And so like even taking off from this spot feels like you're quite a bit, I don't know, it's just laggy. Um, so if you're wanting to go anywhere quickly, you certainly won't get that from this car, even though like, here we go. Like here we go, we're waiting, 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 waiting. Ah, oh, there we go. So it, it is lacking a little bit in that part and whether that's fixing up a, a little bit of turbo lag or even just a, a slightly larger engine might alleviate a little bit of that. Um, maybe not so much the, the transmission in that space, but in other cases, it does feel like it's just looking for the right gear all the time. And that's kind of annoying on the road. But in your general, like driving around in the city, like what we're doing at the moment, um, once you get used to those characteristics, it's a little bit more tolerable and you kind of forget about it a bit more. Um, but overall, we are currently, it does have start stop technology. So this is currently um, turned off. And then if I just move the wheel, it will start up again. Um, or even if you just adjust a little bit on the brake pedal. But you do have your normal safety um, features that you've come to expect now. You've got your blind spot monitoring, lane departure, your active cruise control, which we've spoken about, uh, your one touch indicators. So yeah, you've, you've got a lot of the features that you come to expect from a vehicle like this, particularly for a car that sits in that $36,000, $37,000 drive away point. Um, but yeah, so Overall, fuel economy, I think we've already mentioned that, it's 6.6, uh, which isn't too far away from that claimed 5.8 liters per 100. And um, it probably could even be a little bit lower than that if they had a more adequately sized engine to match the size and the weight of the car. That's it, really. Um, audio isn't too bad. It's certainly nowhere near as good as the TI model, the next step up, where it has uh, your Bose personal audio. So in the sports seat here, you actually have uh, speakers integrated into your headrest. Um, so we haven't experienced that yet, um, but from early accounts, it's actually quite a great experience and it probably leans on some of the things that Bose have learned from their, like, you know, their personal audio sort of shoulder rest thing that they've got going around. Um, and that's a really nice E46 M3, by the way. Sounds good too. Um, <laughs> but would I love to see a performance version of this? Absolutely. I think the chassis is good enough that, kind of like what some people have done in the past where they put a, a GTR underneath here and made like a monster performance duke. Absolutely. I think that that is something that this would really benefit from. Um, but yeah, it's if, if, you, if you don't ask too much from this, um, in terms of just general driving performance, um, you, you certainly won't be disappointed. And I think that's what most people who buy this car will probably be after anyway. They're not after a, a hot hatch or a hot SUV kind of vehicle. And I think that's okay. Um, it's just knowing that, yeah, there's just a few little quirks that you have to get used to. That's our Nissan Juke review. If you'd love to see more, make sure you subscribe, like the video, you know, that like, comment, subscribe thing uh, that happens on YouTube. And um, if you have any questions, let us know. Um, and and one, one last thing, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, The Auto Catch Up. It's our weekly news recap. Uh, we talk about what happens here locally in Australia, around the world, and also what we're all driving each week. So make sure you find that on your favorite podcasting app. But until then, see you next time.